Uh, good morning. Uh, so today we are very pleased uh, to have uh, John Dickey, uh, who is uh, giving the, the seminar. So you might wonder how an exoplanet guy is inviting someone who is working on radio astronomy, which is normally uh, not exactly the same field. So John actually did his PhD in Kernel in the 70s and uh, was working in radio astronomy in the US in Minnesota and moved uh, to Tasmania in 2004. Uh, so at the University of Tasmania in Hobart. So he was the head of, uh, head of the school, and uh, there there are two main groups. One was looking for planets for microlensing. I've been working with them, well, since the 90s, and uh, radio astronomy. And uh, John has been always uh, supporting us when we are doing our planet hunting activities, and we are also interested to know what is going on on the radio astronomy uh, front, ranging from uh, studies in our galaxies to pulsars and VLBI observations. So today we're going to, I think, uh, look for polarization in our galaxy. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you all very much for coming. I know you're not all radio astronomers, so I'll try to make this interesting for you, even if you're not. But uh, certainly, please interrupt me if I say, if I start talking radio talk, and you're not sure what I'm talking about. And let me say, I've given this now at many places, and every time somebody interrupts me about halfway in and says, what are you talking about? So please, let this not be the first place where nobody says that, uh, but I won't point out that point, so it's up to you uh, to try to guess where you should be interrupting me, but to interrupt me with any question that you have. So in, in introduction, let me say that in the radio, the magnetic field shapes much of what we see in the sky. And indeed, the magnetic field is much of what we see in the sky because for much many radio emission processes, the magnetic field is an indispensable part of the emission itself. Uh, synchrotron radiation is an example where you, we would see nothing from the cosmic ray electrons if they didn't interact with the galactic magnetic field. But that said, we still have very few ways of tracing the strength, the quantitative ways of tracing the interstellar magnetic field in the Milky Way. And I'm going to talk about one which has, been, has a long history, but which I think has a very bright future. And that's partly because we had kind of a breakthrough a few years ago. So uh, let's see if this thing works here. Yeah, there we go. So I'm going to talk about using Faraday synthesis to link the magnetic field on large and small scales. And uh, that's me. And here are some of the things that, well, most of the things I'm going to say, really. I'm going to talk about this survey, which we call the Galactic Magneto-Ionic Medium Survey, GMIMS. And uh, I'll explain what that is and why we did it. And why do we have to do Faraday synthesis? That's sort of the theoretical part, which uh, I hope I can make interesting. What do we learn about the galactic B field from the Faraday cube, F of phi? How far are we seeing at wavelengths from about one meter to about 20 centimeters? And that's what we call the polarization horizon. So that's kind of a cartoon in the background. First, let's talk about other ways of tracing the galactic magnetic field besides Faraday rotation. I'll talk about Faraday rotation mostly, but let's remember that we know the galaxy has a magnetic field, or we first knew that, by starlight polarization. 1949, it was clear that many stars had aligned polarization, even in the optical. And this 20 years later, in 1970, already 2,000 had been measured. I don't know if you can see, but there's a little red dot right up there. And if you zoom in, you see, we've come kind of a long way. Now we have something like a million stars polarizations have been measured. And let me say, this is probably the most important breakthrough in tracing the magnetic field, is having the Gaia data release uh, two, which shows us the distances very accurately to all of those stars. And now we can begin to sort out the distances of the magnetic field that causes the alignment. But it's still not a very quantitative measure because it's hard to say how strong is the B field just based on the starlight polarization. Uh, here's a more quantitative measure. This is called Zeeman splitting. And uh, as you probably know, if, uh, Zeeman splitting separates the two circular polarizations. And so you get in the difference of those polarizations kind of a characteristic S-curve. 
And this is a famous figure over many orders of magnitude in density, from 10 to about 10 to the 7, showing the strength of the magnetic field versus density uh, based on Zeeman splitting. And you see uh, what Crusher was claiming, and I think is, is well justified, that the magnetic field is frozen in to the gas as the gas collapses to form stars. And so the B field strength increases sort of along with the density. Now, when I look at that figure, I see something else. I see how hard it is to do Zeeman splitting experiments. Because usually when you look at a graph, all the lines don't go down to the bottom axis. To, to me, this is like the tracks of the tears of the observers who have not detected the Zeeman effect. Because all, many, many of these points all the way up are actually consistent with zero. Now, I'm not questioning the uh, implications, I'm not questioning those detections, but it's awfully hard, and I have tried Zeeman splitting myself, it's awfully hard to detect it uh, with strong signal to noise. So, uh, so much for Zeeman. Oh, yeah, where it is easier is in the masers, because the masers often have quite strong fields and they have very, very strong lines. And so, uh, Mark Reed and, and his collaborators made a few years ago this longitude, this is the galactic longitude velocity, this is the velocity, a longitude velocity diagram of the B field uh, strength and direction. And so the open circles are the B field going clockwise around the Milky Way and the solid circles are the B field going counterclockwise. And I'll come back to that counterclockwise clockwise thing in a moment. Let me move on now to the GMIM survey. The GMIM survey is actually a group of surveys uh, in the north and the south, in the, both hemispheres, at high frequencies and low frequencies. And when we say low frequencies, we mean sort of 250 megahertz to 500. And when we say high frequencies, we mean sort of up to about 2 gigahertz. And so the two that I'll talk about uh, is a high frequency north survey uh, done with the Galt Telescope at the Dominion Radio Astrophysical Observatory in Canada, and the low band, uh, which is done in the south with the Parks dish. And these are some of the collaborators. In fact, this is the GMIMS consortium. But I really do want to point out Tom Landiker, the name at the top. He is definitely the inspiration and the brains behind this whole project. And uh, yeah, without his contribution, none of us would have come together to do this. And I should also mention Mike Voloban and Atari Caretti, who uh, did a lot of the work around observing and working out the observing strategy. And they have been key figures in this project also. When, when most of us want to do a new survey, we sit down and we write a proposal. But when Tom Landecker wants to new, do a new survey, he sits down and designs a new receiver. And this is one that he did, and this is the one that we put on the Parkes Telescope. It has an extremely wide band from uh, 300 to 900 megahertz, uh, extremely good polarization characteristics, dual linear polarization uh, sensitivity. And he built that at the DRAO, and it worked really well. And so we were able to do the survey. Here it is on the way up to the telescope. And I, I didn't build the receiver or even install it, but I did some of the observing. And with this polarization stuff is so, so sensitive that you can only do it at night. And it's so subject to interference that before we started observing, we had to walk up the ladder and turn off everything in the focal cabin and then do our observing all night long. And then in the morning, go up the ladder and turn everything back on for all the other people who wanted to use all of their stuff that was up there because it was very, very sensitive. And what I learned from doing that is uh, the dish protects you for a while. Usually, of course, the weather is beautiful in Australia, but sometimes it gets a bit windy at parks. And as you go up the ladder, especially at dawn, after working all night, you can go up about to here, and you're sheltered by the lip of the dish. But then above that, the wind grabs you like a dry leaf and tries to blow you off to the mountains. And that comes as a surprise because you're already halfway up the ladder. But uh, you wear a harness, so you're, you're perfectly safe. Uh, but it's a, it, it's a surprise. Anyway, um, the purpose of GMEMS is to study the magnetic field in the warm ionized medium. The, uh, most of the other techniques, the starlight polarization, the uh, Zeeman splitting, is in much denser phases of the interstellar medium, the molecular clouds, the dust clouds, 
In the warm ionized medium, we use the diffuse polarized synchrotron emission as a background for Faraday rotation measurement over a wide range of frequencies, or in fact, what's important to us is wavelength squared. This gives a Faraday cube that's like a spectral line cube, except that the third axis is Faraday depth, not velocity. Faraday depth is like rotation measure, RM. The Faraday cube shows the distribution of polarized brightness over rotation measure. And when I realized that was what was going on, I got really interested in this because I, I was a spectroscopist and I love making spectral line cubes. But this is a whole new kind of spectroscopy, Faraday spectroscopy. And that's what I want to try to explain. First, what do we see in polarization surveys? Well, here is an unpolarized view of the sky in the radio. This is at 408 megahertz. Uh, and you see, well, there, you may have seen this before. We, people have been making maps like this since the 50s. Uh, certainly one of the things that stands out is this north polar spur. And of course, the center of the galaxy is quite bright. If you look at much higher frequency, this is the Planck map at 353 gigahertz. And I'm sure you've seen this before too, the sort of brush strokes in this impressionist painting are following the direction of the magnetic field. And so again, the North Polar Spur is fairly prominent, and again, the, the inner galaxy is very bright. If you look uh, at an individual frequency channel, this is at 1630 megahertz, well, you see again the North Polar Spur, you see the, uh, this thing over here is called the fan region. I guess I can just do this the fan region, and many other features, actually. But notice that the brush strokes, which now represent the direction you would think the B field was pointing based on the polarization you measure at 1630 megahertz, well, in some directions, they are quite consistent with the B field direction as measured with Planck. But in other directions, they're quite inconsistent. For example, uh, here, the B field follows the North Polar Spur. Whereas here, it seems to be more or less perpendicular. Now, that's not a problem. What's happened is that the Faraday rotation has turned the plane of polarization from where it was emitted to where we receive it. And it's that Faraday rotation that we're studying with GMIMS. OK. Here's a, here's a little sketch to show what's going on there. Uh, Here's the synchrotron emission. Here's the B field in the plane of the sky. Here's a, a, a <coughs> cosmic ray electron spiraling around the B field. Here is the polarized, linearly polarized emission from the synchrotron that the electron gives off. And here is the warm ionized medium uh, with some electron density. And coming to us from the emission, the plane of polarization is rotated. And that's because of the presence of a line of sight component of the B field. OK? You're so polite. All right. And uh, here, for example, are some background radio sources, extragalactic radio sources, with their Faraday rotation measures measured and plotted on the sky. Red means the field is coming towards us. That's a positive rotation measure. Blue means the field is going away from us. And although much of the Faraday rotation in each individual source is in situ, that is, it's in the source itself, we still see very clear patterns on the sky, just as we do uh, with the starlight polarization. And that's coming from the foreground. And I'll refer to that as the extragalactic foreground Faraday rotation. OK? I'm, I'm pausing here because we're getting to the point where somebody might want to interrupt. But that's all right. Here we have uh, Opperman et al. have uh, smoothed that extragalactic Faraday rotation measures into a map, a continuous distribution. And there are different ways statistically that you can go about doing that. And they did two different papers doing it in different ways. But I think, you know, that given the data that we have, this is probably about as good as you can get. I hope we will get much better data soon. But anyway, so uh, the green is sort of near zero, and the red is very positive, and the blue is very negative rotation measure. Here uh, is another plot, and these are including the extragalactic sources, but also the pulsars. Pulsars are, are polarized, and we can measure their Faraday rotation. And uh, Jinlin Han 
has plotted here, he's, he's done much of the measurements of Faraday rotation into these pulsars. He's plotted the sun is here, the galactic center here. He's plotted plus, pluses for positive and circles for negative rotation with different scales. And what Hahn thinks, and this may be true, is that, is that uh, the, the direction of the B field actually flips, follows the spiral arms, but flips between consecutive arms. Now, I'm not sure if the data justifies the interpretation at that level, but what Hahn says is that whenever we look at a face-on galaxy, well, that's pretty much what we see. We see the B field following the spiral arms. The reversals are not so easy to, to determine in, in other galaxies, but I think there is general agreement that there is at least one field reversal inside of the solar circle in the galactic plane. That is a place where the field is going one way and then it goes the other way. As, for example, Mark Reed had claimed in his LB diagram, and I think that there are many other bits of evidence that point to at least one field reversal. One over here you can sort of see with all of, these are by the way the extragalactic sources near the plane whose rotation measures we have. And matching up, at least according to Han, matching up the pulsars and the extragalactic sources suggests a field reversal here. I've added that word, the Ordog line. Tell us what the Ordog line is. Yeah, I will. So the Ordog line comes from Anna Ordog, who is a PhD candidate at the University of Calgary, working for Joanne Brown, who is a professor there. And they have studied in detail with the VLA many extragalactic source rotation measures. And they're plotted here as either blue circles, which are solid for positive Faraday rotation and open for negative Faraday rotation. And the pulsars also, she's plotted as orange circles. And you see the quite clear demarcation line. This is latitude here and longitude here. And surprisingly, it's not sort of perpendicular to the galactic plane. It, it works at a kind of a shallow angle. And just to confirm that, what she then did was to take the Canadian Galactic Plane Survey, which includes diffuse polariz polarized emission, linear polarization at about 1400 megahertz. And she looked at the Faraday rotation of that diffuse polarized emission. And there also, well, the blue stands for positive and the red stands for negative rotation measures. And you can draw just exactly the same line and you see a reversal of the direction of the rotation measures, which means a reversal of the direction of the magnetic field. Because the, the electron density doesn't care, but the magnetic field certainly does determine the sign of the rotation measure. So this is sort of an interesting thing. You can imagine if there were a wire carrying a current that uh, if the current were flowing that way, we would see B field, uh, I guess if, if the current were flowing, yeah, if the current were flowing that way, we would see B field coming at us above and going away from us below, except that around the wire, the B field drops off as one over R. But if there were a current sheet, that is a flat or more or less flat thing carrying a lot of current, then the B field wouldn't drop off as you go away from the sheet, but it would reverse from one side to the other. And uh, so people talk about current sheets. Uh, God knows if there's real current sheets, but we talk about that in interpreting the magnetic field in the disk of the Milky Way. That was a great question, but kind of a short one. Uh, all right, I'll keep going. Now, this is sort of a toy, well, I would call this a toy model. Uh, this is from Hans Annual Review a couple of years ago. And I think he takes this uh, very seriously, but I would say it sets up uh, the things that we want to know about the magnetic field of the galaxy on a large scale. There's a great deal we want to know about individual star forming clouds and H2 regions and things like that on smaller scales. But on a large scale, well, we would love to know the sun is here. We would love to know if the B field uh, has a component perpendicular to the plane. And the way Han has drawn it here, there is a big dipole through the galactic center, which comes back around through where the sun is. Now we don't, I mean, there's a lot of interesting tracers of the B field in the galactic center, but I would say we have no idea if there's a big, B, uh, big dipole there or not, but we certainly can measure around the sun. Uh, so, you know, our, our job right now is to gradually measure at larger and larger scales around the sun, what is the configuration of the B field on the sky? And that's kind of the purpose of this project. Notice also, though, before I leave this slide, these big red circles. 
And they're often called the toroidal component. And uh, yeah, you know, that's been around for a while. I'll come back to that, though, because I, I think it's not as simple. There certainly is something at intermediate latitudes, but I think it's not as simple as, uh, as just a circle inside of where the sun is around the galaxy. So we'll talk about that in a moment, too. Uh, yeah, so let me go on like that. So wherever there is diffuse polarized continuum emission, we can use it as a background for Faraday rotation study. That's what Ordog uh, and Brown were doing with the Canadian Galactic Plane Survey map, the map that was on the bottom when I talked about the field reversal. They were using the synchrotron emission that had been studied in the Canadian Galactic Plane Survey as a background for doing Faraday rotation measure to try to get an idea of which way the field is pointing between us and that emission. And we can do that all over the sky. But the emission might be mixed with the rotating medium. Many different components of emission with different rotation measures could be contributing. And that becomes a bit complicated. And we have to find a way to separate the different components of the polarized emission that have different Faraday rotation measures. And that's the thing that people didn't really appreciate until about the year 2000. Even though uh, the, the first equation that I'll show here was derived in the 60s, when people early started studying radio polarization. So anyway, let me give you some mathematical background here. When we study the Stokes I emission, we're just looking at a positive definite quantity, that is the brightness of the sky. When we study the Stokes Q and U emission, we're measuring a complex quantity. And you can call that P, which is Q plus I, the square root of minus one times U. Both P and Q can be positive or negative. So this is really a, a anywhere in the complex plane uh, can be P. The position angle or the phase angle of that complex number is one half the arctangent of U over Q. That one half is the contribution of Poincaré. Poincaré, when he defined the Poincaré sphere, said, let's put in a factor of a half so that the entire equator of the sphere is this uh, complex plane on which we measure the linear polarization. And that's good. Now, the rotation measure, I, I, I prefer to define it empirically on the basis of what we can measure. The rotation measure is d chi d lambda squared. Uh, Faraday rotation depends strongly on the wavelength squared. It gets much stronger at long wavelengths. And so by measuring this derivative at any wavelength, we can work out what is the rotation measure. Now, some people prefer to define the rotation measure physically uh, as the column integral, the line of sight integral, from the source to the observer of the electron density times b, the magnetic field, dot ds. And this, because it goes from the source to the observer, gives us positive numbers if the B field is towards us and negative if it's away. But, you know, we can't go out there and see what's on the line of sight, and many different line of sight configurations could give the same rotation measure. So I think it's better to define it empirically like this, and bear in mind the physical origin of the rotation measure like that. Now, what if there are many different components along the line of sight all superposed with different rotation measures? Well, the way we would separate them is to rotate each one back by minus chi. What's chi? Chi is the position angle of that complex number. And it is, since we know we defined Rm as d chi d lambda squared, we can just integrate that equation. We have a constant of integration, which is the position angle at very high frequencies, uh, where the rotation measure is unimportant, at very short wavelength, lambda goes to zero but also a chi is rotation measure times lambda squared. So therefore, the polarization that we see at any value of lambda squared is the magnitude of that vector times e to the 2i chi, where chi is the contribution of rm times lambda squared, or I can just substitute that in. And then, for all different possible rotation measures, I can integrate over lambda squared and get a function of rotation measure, which is the distribution over different rotation measures of the radiation that we're seeing. 
And you see that, well, maybe you can see this is nothing but a Fourier transform. That is, P of lambda squared, which is what we measure, is the Fourier transform of, well, F of phi is the Fourier transform of P of lambda squared, where the two Fourier conjugate variables are phi and two, mi and two lambda squared. And that's fine. We know what lambda we're observing. We know what lambda squared we're observing. We can do this Fourier transform, and we come out with what we call the Faraday spectrum. The Faraday spectrum, because this phi is now an independent variable that we call the Faraday depth. It is, in fact, the rotation measure, but any value of rotation measure is possible now because we're doing a Fourier transform of what we observe. Now, are there questions about that? I, I, don't, I don't want anybody to feel like, I know, I know how you feel when somebody gets into this mathematics and you're not really sure what the heck they're talking about. And I'm supposed to think of phi as a function of position along the line of sign. Ah, that's a very profound question. Let me, uh, let me get to that in about two slides, but let me repeat the question. How should we convert in our minds between phi, this independent variable, and distance along the line of sight. And let me remind you of a very similar problem. When we do spectroscopy, we want to convert frequency or radial velocity into depth along the line of sight. But if you're working in the inner galaxy, nature conspires to say that there's actually two different distances along the line of sight that will give the same velocity. And in, in Faraday rotation, uh, we have a similar ambiguity. So, uh, yeah, let me scoot on to that, so this will answer your question. Imagine that this here is where the telescope is, and this is the line of sight, S or X. And imagine that A, B, and C are different regions of synchrotron emission, and imagine that these white boxes are different regions of warm ionized medium, where there is a magnetic field pointing in the directions of these arrows. Well, if you just walk down along the line of sight number one, you'll find that here you get some Faraday rotation so that the phi increases. And then uh, through A, you get some more Faraday rotation. And in this area, you get actually negative, so that phi decreases. And then there's a big gap. And then here's some more rotation, so phi increases. And then there's more emission. And then there's a region where phi goes all the way down to be negative. Then this is the spectrum that you get. A comes from here. B comes from here because the rotation measure is now quite high. But by the time you get to C, the rotation measure has gone negative again. So you see, it can be rather complicated how to sort out the line of sight uh, distance that corresponds to a given rotation measure. Fortunately, it's not usually that complicated. Here's a, another line of sight that misses some of that, and you get a rather different result. And this was uh, first published by John Brenchens and de Bruyne, and I think, you know, Herr de Bruyne was really a, a pioneer in this, even though that equation that I showed you uh, was published by Byrne in 1966. So it's funny that the significance of the Faraday cube didn't really sink in until about 40 years after this was worked out. Good question. More questions? Okay. Now here's some actual Faraday spectra. Uh, and these are, I, I pulled these out of the Faraday cube. And let me, let me say that uh, making the Faraday cube is complicated because you don't cover all wavelengths. And you get the same problem that you have in aperture synthesis where you cover a part of the Fourier transform plane of what you want to study. We have this, well, all apertures do that for us. Uh, they, they create uh, resolving functions or smoothing functions or point spread functions. And the point spread function uh, for the Faraday cube can be a very messy thing if you don't cover a very broad range of wavelengths. And Tom Landiger had to design that receiver because he wanted to cover a fractional bandwidth of three. That is from wavelength of about one meter down to wavelength of about 30 centimeters. And that's a difficult thing to do, but we can do it, and more and more. So anyway, uh, here are two different directions. So latitude and longitude are here. In each case, there is a pulsar in that direction, which is why I cut out these uh, spectra. And the red is the, in, in this case, both the parks and the DRIO surveys cover those directions. So the red is the low frequency survey, and the black is the high frequency survey. 
The point spread function in the high frequency survey is much broader than in the low frequency survey because the lambda squared coverage, fractional coverage, is much worse. And that means that really we're not resolving this uh, line at all in the high frequency survey, but we do have the resolution to resolve it in the low frequency survey. In this case, there are actually multiple components that we can pretty well make out uh, in the Faraday spectrum. By the way, this uh, kind of cyan or green line is the rotation measure of the pulsar in that direction, and the distance of the pulsar is given here. And the blue line is the rotation measure of the extragalactic sources, which have been interpolated to give us an extragalactic foreground. So it's not always as clean, but often what you see is that uh, the Faraday spectrum is working its way out towards the distant uh, universe, which would be the maximum contribution of the Milky Way galaxy. Questions on that? Now, what I find useful when I'm doing spectroscopy is to use the moments of the spectra. And people who fit rotation curves of galaxies and so on will compute these. Uh, and the moment zero is just the integral, which is the total luminosity or the total flux. Moment one is the flux-based uh, median of the rotation measure. Ordinarily, we would call that V bar if we were talking about velocity. And moment two is the line width, which is uh, given by the flux-weighted uh, phi, in this case, or V minus moment one. And you can, uh, you can actually see that because I draw over the top of each of these spectra uh, at the height of the zeroth moment, which is the average, and centered on the first moment, a bar with whose width is the second moment. Now, you, you can use other techniques for doing this, but this is just one that is fairly simple and characterizes the distribution of flux. Although it doesn't really capture when you have multiple uh, components, which sometimes do. Usually the multiple components show up in a particularly broad second moment uh, of the, the spectrum. Here's, by the way, the entire sky. If you measure the entire sky, and I don't split it now into northern hemisphere and southern hemisphere, I will do that. But this is if you split it into positive and negative rotation measure. And the high frequency survey and the low frequency survey are both shown here. Again, the high frequency survey doesn't resolve the rotation measure distribution. But the low frequency survey does resolve it, and in fact it notices, it picks up a small change, just a, a maybe not even one uh, radian per meter squared uh, between the, the positive and negative. And actually you need two Gaussians to fit this, if you fit it with Gaussians. So anyway, for the two GMM surveys, we compute the moments of the Faraday spectra over the whole sky. They show discrete structures, including H2 region shadows and large-scale patterns. The discrete structures are interesting in their own right, and they are actually the topics of the PhD thesis of Alec Thompson, who's a, a PhD student just finishing at uh, Australian National University. And this talk is mostly about the big picture and the overall statistics, but let me just uh, show you one picture. This is Alec, uh, and he, by the way, is, is one of the people who made the Faraday cubes that I'm working from. And this is Sharpless uh, 227, which is an H2 region around the star Zeta Ophi. Zeta Ophi is quite nearby, and uh, this is a very big thing on the sky, a distance of something like 180 parsecs. Now here, this sort of looks like a velocity position, position velocity diagram, but it's actually a Faraday position diagram, because this is the Faraday spectrum. And what Alec has done is to average in annually at progressively larger distances from the ionizing star. And interestingly, you see actually three bumps over most of the H2 region. This dashed line shows the Strumgren radius. And this is the spectrum sort of in here. And as you get out beyond the Strumgren radius, you begin to see really just sort of one or maybe two components. And Alec has explained that in terms of a propagation model, which incorporates the depolarization of the H2 region. H2 regions depolarize the emission, not because they absorb the polarization, they don't, but because they cause so many small-scale changes in the position angle of the linear polarization that when you observe it with a telescope, they all cancel out, and you can no longer detect polarized emission. And that's quite a strong effect in a real classical H2 region, and it even comes up in the warm ionized medium, 
uh, if the path length is too long. So here's the uh, moment zero from the high frequency DRIO survey. This area down here is the southern, uh, south uh, celestial pole where they can't see. Here again we see uh, the uh, north polar spur and the fan region and many other things. Here's a similar moment zero from the Parks survey in the south. Uh, here's um, the moment one from the DRIO survey. So this is the flux weighted mean rotation measure. Here's moment one from the Parks survey. Here's moment two from the uh, DRIO survey and moment two from the Parks survey. And here, in comparison, is the extragalactic uh, foreground map that I showed you before. And actually, this looks really quite a bit like the moment one map. The moment one map has a lot more detail because it doesn't have to be smoothed. But by and large, what you see is this positive area, negative area. Over here, kind of a positive area, negative areas up there. You can't see uh, the corresponding negative, uh, positive area down in here because it's in the south. Now, if you, um, if you now average over bands at different latitudes, and so this is the latitude up here in magnitude of B from 15 degrees right up to 90 degrees. And what I've done here is averaged over bands uh, with different path lengths through a plane parallel layer. So what I'm really doing is averaging in steps of cosecant B and starting with one, which is at 90 degrees, to one and a half, which is at about 42 degrees, to two, which is at 30 degrees, etc. The path lengths are getting longer as we go to the right, as we go down in latitude. Well, we see now that the negative latitudes gradually increase as we go towards the pole, but positive latitudes stay flat or actually decrease going towards the pole. Now, I have large samples of points in each of these, and the, the scatter, the standard deviation, is shown by the length of these lines. And the formal error of the mean is shown by these little uh, error bars on the averages. And if I, uh, if I zoom in on the highest latitude, you see that although it's a very small difference, the northern hemisphere in red has a positive rotation measure, and the southern hemisphere has negative rotation measure. Now, this goes back to the question of, is there a, a Z-directed field near the sun? Is there a field that goes perpendicular to the galactic plane? And these are pretty small numbers. I mean, this, this would point towards a, a field, you know, on the order of one microgauss. But it's interesting to compare with the extragalactic RM. In fact, they're almost exactly the same. So here is the, uh, from the GMIMS, the first moment distribution. And here is taking the same points, but using the extragalactic sources to give the rotation measure. And we see almost exactly the same thing. Except you really want these two lines to cross. Because uh, Ann Mao, Sui Ann Mao, uh, in 2010, used the VLA to try to test whether there is a Z component of the B field. And she, f she chose about 100 sources, all higher than 77 degrees, half in the north, northern galactic cap and half in the southern galactic cap. And she found just the opposite, that in that extremely uh, weighted towards the pole sample, she got about plus six from uh, the blue, and the blue is the south pole, and about zero from the north pole. So that's, I think, why Han drew, drew the uh, B field coming up uh, through the plane and pointing out uh, positively through the, the north side of the plane. But I think this suggests that it's maybe a little more complicated than that. And uh, in fact, what we're seeing towards the poles is linked to a larger scale distribution of the field at high latitudes. Now, to estimate the distance of the Faraday rotating medium, we compare the rotation measures with, with rotation measures of pulsars. So here, uh, I plot the pulsar rotation measures versus the DRAO moment one. And uh, this, there's, there's not great correlation, because of course, the pulsars are just one point, and they give us a rotation measure from that point to here, whereas with a, with a big telescope survey, we're measuring all the rotation measures to all the distribution of flux. But there's a fair correlation. And as you take larger and larger distances to the samples, here there's only about 15 pulsars within 700 parsecs. Well, the correlation actually gets worse, but the uh, P, that is the probability of null hypothesis, gets better. 
So uh, I think there is significant correlation, but not perfect correlation. And analyzing that, I think that the pulsar rotation measures and the first moment rotation measures of the two GMIM surveys show that at low frequencies, we don't see very far. We see about 300 parsecs. And we call that the polarization horizon because beyond that, depolarization wipes out the synchrotron polarization. We can't detect it. But at high frequencies, we can see much farther. At latitudes above about 10 degrees, uh, the horizon is at least 500 parsecs and maybe a few kiloparsecs away. And so we can actually see out into the halo uh, when we look at the higher frequency survey. How many pulsars? Well, the total number of pulsars whose rotation measures have been measured is about 1,000. Uh, what Han has done, now most of them are in the galactic plane at, at quite large distances. So they're interesting for studying the galactic plane, but they don't help much. Uh, at, the, at distances out to five kiloparsecs, above 20 degrees, there's about 75. And so I've, I've sort of worked with that sample primarily. Yeah, good question. No question. All right, now finally, let, oops, sorry. Let me go back and talk about this mid-latitude quadrupole which were the big red circles on, on the Han diagram. The rotation measures of pulsars and extragalactic sources and the DRAO first moment maps all show a sign 2L dependence in both hemispheres between latitude about 50, 20 and 50 degrees. Let me show you that. So here's a very nice paper by Zhu and Han uh, earlier this year. And these are, are nearby pulsars, pulsars within three kiloparsecs, 500 parsecs to three kiloparsecs. And this is the sample uh, that we have, really. And uh, this is the moment one map. I've used a different color scheme now. And uh, what I'm going to do is to follow this line, constant latitude, go over the full longitude range, and plot out, I don't know if you can see the scale here, but this is a rotation measure, 0, 50, 100, 150, minus 50, minus 100, minus 150. And so this is uh, the rotation measure versus longitude. There's a gap here, which is where it goes through that white area. And you see quite a strong component with a sine 2L. So I've just fitted a sine 2L with arbitrary amplitude and phase. And then I've done the same uh, for the extragalactic, which I showed you already. And that gives, uh, if I, that gives a curve like this, which has also got a quite nice sine 2L, also with a phase of very close to zero. Here I plot them on top of each other. And then here, if I can do it, uh, I want to show just a little movie. As we step that line up in latitude, starting at about 25 degrees, this is 29. Uh, whoops, didn't start, sorry. Let's see here. Yeah, here we go. Here we go. Now we're starting at 29 to 30, 31, 32. You can watch these sine curves move. Ah. This one. There they go. You can watch these sine curves move, and you can watch the phase angle of each. They stay quite consistent at, at pretty close to zero until we get to latitude 50 degrees, and then the whole pattern goes away. And that's uh, that's essentially what Han has interpreted as the big red circles or toroidal field. But uh, did it get there? Oh, no, it stopped again. Here we go. Oops. Well, I don't want to belabor this, but the point is... Uh, we get a strong effect both in the positive and negative latitudes. And I would call that a mid-latitude quadrupole. Mid-latitude quadrupole is not seen at all in the park's first moments. So it is something which is happening further away than about 300 parsecs. Probably not due to the local bubble, some have interpreted it that way. Probably not just due to the North Polar Spur, some people have interpreted it that way. And now we can compare that with structure at smaller angular scales. This is a uh, Lumpskogel periodogram of the data I just showed you, where we're working out the Fourier components, uh, or if you like, the YLMs, 
but just looking at different L's, two cycles per 360 degrees, four, six, eight. And all of these have this spike at about two cycles, sine two L. Uh, here at the high latitudes, that goes away. And here we have, uh, for the positive latitudes, the log of the periodogram. And the Lump-Scargle periodogram is just a Fourier transform, but implemented when you have gaps in your data. And what we see, so that uh, sine 2L log of 2 is 0.3, so we see this high point. Here I plot both the DRAO moment 1 and the extragalactic foreground. What we're seeing here is, I think, some kind of a spectrum of smaller scale structure in the B field in the halo. And you can compare that. Well, people have done this before. This is Haverkorn from Marika Haverkorn's work on the SGPS. This is Robitaille et al. 2017. And there are some more recent papers by Heron et al. Looking at, now in this case, what Robitaille et al. did was to split that into the B and the E components. Because this is very important to the people studying the cosmic background polarization as well. They need to know what the foreground contribution is. So uh, we, what you see here is a, uh, he's just analyzed this field in that case. But we see something like a power law spectrum, which is presumably related to the turbulence spectrum in the interstellar medium. And indeed, it might be the turbulence spectrum, because the turbulence in the interstellar medium may be dominated by the strength of the magnetic field. Certainly in the warm neutral and warm ionized medium, the energy density in the B field is as great as the kinetic energy density of the thermal and turbulent plasma. So anyway, it's time for me to stop. My conclusion is we can survey the sky with broadband receivers, frequency range 250 megahertz to 2.5 gigahertz, to learn about the magnetic field configuration on a large scale. Comparing the first moments of the Faraday cubes with pulsar RMs gives an estimate of the distance to the horizon at each wavelength. Comparing the rotation measures of the diffuse synchrotron emission with the foreground rotation measures of extragalactic sources shows overall good agreement. And the spatial structure of the Faraday cube could indicate the level of large versus small scale fluctuations in the B field. What we will do next, well, the Possum Survey, which is an Australian square kilometer array pathfinder survey, will probably multiply the number of extragalactic rotation measures by at least a factor of five, maybe a factor of 10. And that'll be great. Single dish surveys are needed to complete the GMIMS. We need at least two more surveys, and people are working on that. Simulations are needed to help interpret the spatial power spectra. So uh, speaking of the horizon, I'll leave you with this picture. This is the horizon as seen from Tasmania looking south. And uh, you will want to come because all of this is national park. And uh, you, can, you can take hikes for many weeks in the wilderness in Tasmania. And I hope we'll see you there. Thank you. Thank you, John. Questions? Yes? A very simple question, right? So the, the uh, lovely diagram of the galaxy with all of the different field lines, to what extent then has that been validated by all these observations? Is that really, should I go, go away and think, you know, that's what the magnetic field looks like in the galaxy? Well, I show that because, as I say, it's a toy model or a straw man. There are things in the sky that motivate everything that's on that picture. But I don't think it's that simple. I don't think it's that simple. And I think the more we study, and, and certainly the, the GMIM survey, is directed towards trying to determine what's the next stage of complication. But in particular, the big red circles, which are called the toroidal component, somehow they go beyond the sun in a way as such a way as to give us a quadrupole. And usually it's easy to get a dipole, but it's hard to get a quadrupole. The only analog I can think of is Cam's law, where you look at the velocities of stars uh, as you go out from the sun, and they show a sine 2L dependence with Oort's constant A as the amp amplitude. But I, I can't see how to do that with a B field, at least a simple uh, B field. Yeah, good question. Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't understand how you reconcile the correlation you see between the uh, uh, Faraday measurements towards extragalactic sources and uh, part is synthesis before your idea of a short horizon because uh, yep. we know that the scale type of electrons in the galaxy is like kiloparsec, so yep. scale type of the magnetic field is several kiloparsec. So how, if, if there is really such a short horizon, we should see differences right. between the two. Indeed, 
and I kind of glossed over that. If you do a correlation between the low frequency survey, the PARC survey, with the extragalactic uh, rotation measures, you see zero correlation. They are completely uncorrelated. And that puzzled me for a long time, but it must be that the horizon at the low frequencies is much closer than uh, the edge, as you say, the, the scale height of the electron layer. But in the DRAO survey, you see pretty good correlation. And therefore, at the high frequencies, about uh, 1.5 gigahertz, we must be mostly seeing out at the higher latitudes. At the low latitudes, you don't see much correlation at all. So we're not seeing kiloparsecs across the disk. So the horizon would be like a kiloparsec? The horizon, yeah. The horizon in the high frequency survey, one or two kiloparsecs. In the low frequency survey, maybe 300 parsecs. That, that would be my best guess. Yeah, good question. Oh, the angular resolution, yeah. So they're actually both about the same, even though the frequencies are very different because the size of the telescopes are different. But it's about a degree. About a degree, yeah. And it's not, I mean, it would be nice, well, don't get me started. It would be nice to use interferometers, to use aperture synthesis telescopes to do this, but then you really need to uh, bring in the short spacings from the single dish. And Marika Hevercorn has done some experiments that way. For example, LOFAR, gives much better resolution. They've done a lot of this too, but they don't have the zero spacing. So uh, it, it's not as easy to interpret the results. For, for, for distant galaxies, it's, it's fine, but to try to do the whole sky is more difficult. Question about what? Extragalactic, yes? Well, uh, most of the rotation measure that we see towards the extragalactic sources is galactic. There is a component which is extragalactic, and we can sort of estimate that now because we know the dispersion measures of the uh, fast radio bursts, as you say. Uh, and also, there is rotation intrinsic to the sources, and sometimes that can be quite complicated. The source emission can be interspersed with Faraday rotating material. However, what Upperman et al. have done, and I showed uh, the, uh, the, the gridded extragalactic map. They have taken, a, we have now about 40,000 rotation measures towards extragalactic sources, and they have used various statistical processes. Uh, some are, are, are sort of a priori and some are a posteriori, but to, to make the map that I have been, been working from uh, to compare with the, the GMIM survey. And I, you know, it, it, in, there in certain areas, it's terrible. In some areas, it's pretty good. But unfortunately, nobody, none of the extragalactic sources that contribute to that were done with broad bands. And so we don't really understand the Faraday spectrum of any of those sources. So it, it, it's still a, a, a fairly early stage. Okay. Why is there a what at the end? There is a lion on the logo oh, of the University. Yeah, that, that's a very good question. Now, let me say what I think that should be is the Tasmanian tiger. The Tasmanian tiger was a marsupial animal, which was like a wolf more than a tiger. Um, alas, they went extinct in the early 1900s. Uh, but I think that's the, maybe the lion that, uh, was it St. George? Uh, did St. George fight a lion or fought a dragon? Uh, somebody, it, it comes from Great Britain. <laughs> that's all I can say. Good question. Okay. Thank you. Dr. All right. Thank you. Thanks for coming.